Man shall live forevermore because of Christmas Day. That's uh, Jim Reeves with uh, an old island song, uh, Mary's Boy Child. Well, I'm broadcasting this Christmas Day from uh, sunny California, <laughs> but it's not so sunny in fact it just uh, started raining they say it only rains twice a year here in this part of the state uh, but it's rained uh, quite a bit since i've arrived and uh, but you can still kind of get the feel of california not the most christmassy uh, place on earth but uh, the oranges are delicious and uh, it's a it's a good uh, place to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We want to look today at uh, John chapter 1. And uh, if you have your Bibles, please open them to that. But I have to warn you, St. John's Christmas story has no angels. He leaves out Luke's shepherds and Matthew's magi. He has no little town of Bethlehem no dreams, uh, no dates, no holy family. These traditional elements were, of course, well known to uh, St. John, uh, because remember that John was the one who took Mary into his home uh, immediately following the death of Jesus on the cross. John had said, son, behold your mother, mother, behold your son. And from that day on, we are told that John took Mary into his home. So if there uh, were anyone uh, familiar uh, with the details of the story of the Nativity, uh, it would be Mary who uh, knew them best. And certainly she shared them with John uh, over and over again, or he listened to her tell those stories to others. And uh, we have what we believe is Mary's story recorded for us in the Gospel according to St. Luke. Now, uh, even though John knew about all the colorful characters mentioned by the other Gospel writers, uh, the only one who figures prominently in the, in the Christmas story, uh, as the other Gospels describe it, is John the Baptist. Uh, he will appear at the end of, uh, or throughout chapter one of, of the Gospel according to St. John, uh, as a witness to the, uh, to, the, to the arrival of the Messiah uh, in the person of Jesus. But for the others, for Mary and Joseph, Simeon and Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, look at all those details, none of them appear in John. These kinds of people are mentioned only by allusion, and those allusions are only noticeable to those who have themselves mastered uh, the other nativity stories and who read this gospel with careful, thoughtful, prayerful attention. I want you to watch, though, and see if you can pick out some of John's allusions to the other gospel stories uh, in his Christmas story. And we want to begin now in chapter 1, verse 9 of the Gospel according to St. John, where we read, The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. Let's call this verse John's introduction to the nativity of the Lord. Uh, really, all of chapter 1 leading up to this is, 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 is introductory, but it's introductory to the whole Gospel, 
this is where we really uh, kind of zero in on the nativity. Um, but uh, let's look at this. If, if Jesus called here both the Word and the true light, those are the names that John gives Jesus here, if he was coming into the world, uh, then the first thing that we want to notice is that his birth was not his beginning. And uh, so th this leads us to understand that John frames the, the nativity not in terms of birth, but in terms of what the theologians call incarnation. That means the taking upon himself of a human body. Um, now, John has already made it clear at the head of the chapter that Jesus precedes creation and that Jesus indeed participated in creation. And as a participant in creation, he cannot be a part of that which is created. He's not a creature. And so here's the mystery. How then can that which transcends creation enter it, be born into it? It is from John's gospel that the creedal phrase begotten, not made, has its origin. Uh, he who was begotten of the Father before all worlds, uh, yet somehow entered our world in human form, this is a mystery. And uh, John doesn't resolve this mystery, but he insists that we cannot see Jesus properly apart from it. Jesus' birth was not his beginning it was his incarnation. Now, just after verse 9, John suspends his account of Jesus' arrival on earth, and he jumps ahead to summarize the outcome of his life and ministry taken as a whole. Uh, we read here in verse 10, He, that is Jesus, was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Now, don't miss this. Uh, we spoke on Christmas Eve about having a heart like Bethlehem. A heart like Bethlehem has no proper space for Jesus. But, Luke, but, but John broadens the blame stain that Luke lays on the little town of Bethlehem. And he says it's not merely Bethlehem that has no room for the Messiah, his own people. That is, his own nation, Israel, did not receive him. So did all Israel have a heart like Bethlehem? Was their collective response to the true light uh, to say no room, no space, no proper accommodation? I mean, it seems at first as if all Israel responded to the appearance of this light, John describes, by shielding their eyes and asking, turn it off, turn it off, like a, like a teenager. Uh, who needs to go to school and his parents flick on the light switch and they say, please turn it off, turn it off, I don't want to see it. Let me keep sleeping. Is that really the way all Israel reacted to the coming of the Messiah? Well, John admits immediately that he has uh, used hyperbole. He has overstated the situation. Not everyone failed to find space for Jesus. Not all hearts were like Bethlehem. Some made space for this light, this word of God incarnate. Some opened their minds and their hearts to the light. Some had hearts like Mary and Joseph with happy results. And we read about those happy results in verse 12. Sometimes in preaching we can focus on the, on the negative consequences of disobeying God. Here I want to focus on the positive consequences of obedience to God. Verse 12 of John chapter 1 says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, did you catch that? If you're looking for allusions, not illusions, but allusions <laughs> to the uh, gospel story as it's presented, say, in Luke or Matthew, then you will understand that that Jesus uh, that that John that is 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 uh, not really missing Mary after all. She's not named, but she's here because her own reception of Jesus, uh, as it's described, for example, by Luke, 
is what John recycles here as the pattern of the new birth, as the pattern for those who have a new beginning with God and become God's children. And so we want to ask if, 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 if I'm saying that this is an allusion to what happened to Mary, how did Mary receive Jesus? Well, at the word of the angel, which she understood to be the word of God, she made room for the Messiah in her womb. Once she understood what God was asking of her, she responded by saying, I am the Lord's handmaiden. Let it be done unto me according to your word. And what had the angel's word been? He had told her that the Spirit of God would bring the Son of God into her womb without any human agency. He would be born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of a husband. Hey, honey, we, let's have a baby together. No, not of a husband's will, but this baby would be born of God. And for that reason, the Holy Child would be called the Son of God. And so Mary received Jesus, how? By faith in God's word. She believed God's word, and because she believed God's word, she received Jesus. You may remember that when Mary's cousin Elizabeth praised her in Luke 2.34, she used the language of faith. Uh, we, we, we cannot please God without faith. Here's what Elizabeth said to Mary when she first encountered her uh, carrying the Messiah. Uh, Elizabeth said, Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. There again is the acknowledgement that, that what the angel had said to Mary was nothing but the message of God. That's what angels are. Angels are messengers of God. And uh, they serve God by bringing his word to us. Well, the pattern that Mary uh, demonstrated is the pattern for all those who would experience a miraculous birth uh, and become the children of God. Follow me here. To, to receive Jesus means to believe, as Mary believed, uh, to, to receive Jesus is to believe on his name, to believe that he is indeed God's son our Savior. It means recognizing, as Mary recognized, that our Savior is uniquely God's Son. Uh, and the Messiah took up the most sacred, the most special, the most inconvenient place within Mary. He was a very expensive guest, but it was in making room for that inconvenient little neighbor, that inconvenient little guest, that embarrassingly inexplicable little guest, that Mary became God's literal dwelling place. From beneath the dome of that holy temple that was her body, the true light then came forth into the world of men. Uh, the apostles certainly enjoin us to hospitality uh, of, to anyone. With this motivation, they say some have entertained angels without being aware of it. And so when you encounter strangers that need a place, uh, give them a place, feed them, take care of them. But Jesus really takes that idea further because he says that whatever we have done to the least of his brothers, we have done to him. Now, now Mary knew that she was receiving the Messiah. In other words, she didn't know that she was just, she knew that she was not receiving just some ordinary uh, guest uh, at God's request. Uh, she knew that she was receiving the Messiah, but I wonder, did she know that in becoming the Messiah's dwelling place, she had literally become the temple of God? Did she fully understand that, that, that she was about to give birth to the one who in his divinity was his, her creator? Um, I think we see here that a heart like Mary's can do more than it knows it's doing by simply obeying the word of God. When we obey the Word of God, He doesn't always explain everything to us. He just lets us know that this is His Word. The devil always challenges it. You know, is, has God really said this, that, or the other thing? But, but 
um, if we obey God's word simply because it is God's word, we will often find that we have done more than we uh, even understood. On the other hand, a heart like Bethlehem excludes more than it knows by its disobedience to God's word. And so notice this parallel as well. Mary presents herself as God's handmaid, God's servant. But what John says is that to all who received Jesus, to all who became God's servants, all who believed on his name, God gave the right to become children of God. God gave the right to become his children. And so in receiving God's son, Mary became, or at least was acknowledged to be God's daughter. Uh, in a like manner, when you respond to God's instructions with the phrase, your servant, heaven answers back, my child. Elsewhere, John says, behold, what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called the sons of God. Well, to come back to, to John's Christmas, with all of his Christmas illusions, subtly but elegantly made, John then describes uh, the nativity proper in one sentence. Here it is. Are you ready? Verse 14. This is really John's entire Christmas story. And the word, that is Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Glory means weight, importance, value. God's importance radiated from Christ, the way light radiates from the sun and stars. And uh, a heart like Bethlehem uh, covers that light up. It shoves what is most important into that space of life that is least important. Bethlehem put the most important person who'd ever been born into the least important place that they had, uh, the manger in a, in a stable, probably something like a cave. And uh, so if a heart like Bethlehem shoves what is most important into that space of life that is least important, we have, on the other hand, the heart like Mary, the heart like Mary believes no space is too God, good for God and for his requested use. God gets what he asks. His word is her only priority. She is God's servant and her obedience is absolute. Bethlehem gives Jesus uh, a manger in a stable. Israel could allow Jesus only to be a teacher or a prophet maybe, but not Lord and Christ. They didn't have room for that kind of Jesus. Well, C.S. Lewis once said this, Christianity, is, if false, is of no importance, and if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. And I think that that, that last phrase is, uh, is troubling because it seems to me to describe much of the Western world. We have decided that Jesus is somewhat important. We like some of his teachings, some of his instructions, uh, a bit of his example. We like the fact that he didn't have the, 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 the woman caught in adultery stoned and that he rubbed the noses of the religious hypocrites in their hypocrisy. But there are other things about Jesus that we don't like so much. And so we do give him some space, but not much space and certainly not the most important space. And C.S. Lewis says that won't do. Uh, and the Bible certainly agrees with that. Um, Mary understood that, that, that God's word was of ultimate importance, and therefore Jesus uh, was of ultimate importance, and recognized the infinite importance of God and of his Messiah, put her on the path to importance in God's kingdom, although it put her in the barn uh, for the time being. And so the question that I would uh, pose is, do you have a heart like Bethlehem or a heart like Mary? And my suggestion is that you can have a heart like Mary if by God's light you seek what's most important. If you 
listen to God's word, if you open your eyes to that light that entered the world at the incarnation, listen, that light is still shining. The darkness did not and could not overcome it. The time is still ripe. The way is still open. There's no spiritual lockdown, not yet, at least. To all who receive Jesus still, to all who believe in his name today, he still gives the right to become the children of God. And uh, that's my own desire. I hope it's your desire that we might be called the children of God. Behold, what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called children of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Trumpet sound.